What's up, guys? My girl, Ghost in Real Life, is back on the podcast again, but this time in person. I was so pumped to be able to sit down with her in person before she absolutely wrecked the DNBNL stage for the Deadbeats Jamboree this past July 4th weekend in Denver, Colorado. Love her energy always. I get along with her so well. Maggie is just an absolute sweetheart who is killing it, continuing to develop and find her sound and has a huge community backing her and growing behind her. She had just come off a huge string of shows, Emo Night in LA, doing dead beats. She's played a handful of shows with the Worship Artists and it's just been very cool to watch her grow over the past few years. We originally met when we were doing stuff with Girl Gang or that was the first time that I really saw her project and to think about then in 2019 to now in 2024, it is like so wild to conceptualize. Uh, It is always lovely sitting down and chatting with her. We always have something to talk it up about, hear what's going on with the project. I believe an EP is on the way, new shows, and she's always announcing or posting about something just cool and rad and dope. So this is Lizzie Jane. You're tuning into my podcast with Ghost in Real Life. Let's get into it. Ghost in Real Life, Maggie, you are back on the podcast. You are here in Denver, Colorado, <laughs> about to play the Deadbeats annual 4th of July Jamboree. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty great. <laughs> Ooh, that's so exciting. And this is your first time in Denver? One of your first times playing in Denver? This is my first time playing in Denver. I've oh definitely been here before, but okay. not played. That's so exciting. Well, yeah. you have one hell of an event that you're playing. There's everything from like – the hot dog eating competitions to the fact that it's on the Civic Center Park, which is like our capital's ground. And I really yeah. don't know <laughs> any other city that like endorses music like this. And every year when Zed's Dead and the Deadbeats crew comes to town, you have like four major parties and it's just a marathon. And you're part of it this year. And it's DNB and L. So we have brownies and lemonade that are part of it too. And you've been kind of all over since we last talked because we saw each other in New York and you were playing the worship part. You were playing Chase and Status. Chase and Status. And then you went coast to coast. You went back to LA to play the Hollywood Palladium for the worship party. And then from there, you've played like a handful of brownie and lemonade events. I've seen you do some stuff with Bass Rush. Like give us and like an up-to-date kind of check in with your project and where everything's at right now. <laughs> so much is happening. It's so exciting. Yeah, yeah, no. Br- uh, Brownies and Lemonade have been so good to me. Like I really love working with them. They put on the best events. Um and they they're really pushing drum and bass in America right now. So I I really love sticking with them. Um they're also just the nicest guys to work with, yeah. you know. Um and then let's see Bass Rush yeah, we did the pop up with Turno, um, and we did. Uh, I'm trying to refresh my memory right now. Oh, so the, many secrets! The sets. Grave Rave. Oh That's, yes! Oh my god, that was so cool. So that was like um, Insomniac and Emo Night, which is so perfect for you. <laughs> it's like the definition of perfection. <laughs> when we've had this conversation before, where like you really take a lot of these like early punk, Panic at the Disco, Green Day kind of rock songs and make them drum and bass. And then you have Emo Night that does this. And it just like, it couldn't be a better match. So like, how was that? Because the energy from that looked just absolutely insane. And it was at Academy, right? Yeah. Uh, With the visuals, everything, dream. It was so cool because I had a mosh pit. (laughs) And I'm like- A real mosh pit. Yeah, they were like, you know, kids and they were like, all on Hot Topic outfits, just in the mosh pit. And it's just like, it really brought me home because when I was in high school, I was this teeny tiny little 16-year-old diving into mosh pits at these like punk shows with these like hefty 30-year-old men. (laughs) And I'd come out with all these bruises and cuts all over my knees, but I felt amazing. (laughs) Oh, there's nothing like... (laughs) A metal show. There's nothing like a punk show. Mm. The energy, you just won't match it. You Mm. won't match it. And it's cool because you've obviously seen so much, so many people who love like metal and rock translate into 
dubstep because of the song structures being like super the same and you kind of have the head banging aspect. But now, I mean, I even feel like for drum and bass, you could literally have like two stepping or a circle pit and it could literally work so well, but it's just in different energy and people who have existed in those scenes, like what you said, kind of where you're from, New York, New Jersey, upper state kind of northeast area and then I've experienced the same thing in Florida where we used to go to like skate park of Tampa transitions be in a room literally a fourth of the size and you're standing on the benches and people are jumping off the benches into the mosh fits you don't <laughs> find that that kind of intense intimate energy in electronic dance music you just don't no you don't and like a lot of like my musical influence comes from like when I was in high school and I was, you know, driving to whatever I was about to go do with my friends and we'd all gather into my car and we'd blast whatever we could on the radio, you know, and it was like those were like the best moments. So it's like I really try to bring that energy into like my music and like my sets, you know, like that whole group of like we all know the words and and we can sing along and we can dance and like just be happy even though our lives like Loki kind of suck. <laughs> I, one, I love that. And it's so (laughs) true because you have this demeanor to your voice where I think we all go through it if we don't necessarily do it live. Where do you ever get people who don't necessarily understand that like you're singing in all of your tracks? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then people are like, whoa, wait, this is totally you. But you have that like encompassed angsty meets like teenage punk like your new song with like the burning the bras and then the other record where you're throwing the plates and it's like all of this energy to just be like you know what this is like a space for us to just express who we are and like what we're doing and like fuck the world and we're gonna burn everything if we want (laughs) but we're doing it like together as a fan base and I feel like your community has grown so much in that has it been really enlightening to see your fan base just like grow, grow, grow. Yeah. Like I feel like we're all becoming friends um, and we're all just like, it's like a lot of like my fan base are kind of just like my friends. <laughs> like it's how like, it should be. It's like hard sometimes to keep track of all of them, but there's like, I do have like a small discord community mm-hmm. that like some of them I like, I have one guy I always play like Monopoly with. And we're always sharing like cards so that on our on like our sticker album oh, so we can get so more good. rolls. <laughs> oh my god! And like some of my fans will send me like the funniest memes. Like this one girl told me today that she's bringing her mom to my set, and then she sent me this meme. It was so funny. It was like, I hope this email never finds you, and I hope you are free. <laughs> oh. Oh my God. It's like this satire, <laughs> dry humored community. And that's great. I mean, I think that just like in the world of social media where everything is, how can we be viral and how can we hit the numbers and how can we like do the remixes to really pop off? There's almost like a lacking of a sense of community and like what you're doing. And mm. then for me to see just like your community really grow so organically you really can't choose your fans as an artist. So I feel like the fans that have chosen you like fit who you are so well. Yeah. I mean, well, your, your energy attracts your tribe. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I always try to be like really accepting. Like I never want someone to feel like they're too weird to be in my crowd or like they're too like odd or they're not a certain way. So they can't be my fan. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like I try to like create just like a space for people just to exist and everyone's just kind of like instead of getting like offended and and mad at everyone for being a certain way, we're just like, cool, whatever. Sure, do that. Whatever. Cool. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Do you. (laughs) Do you. Do you. No, I fuck with that so much too because again, it's just like the societal pressures of like fitting in and like fitting to a certain status quo or like having like, even from an artist's perspective, like everybody has like the quote unquote lunchbox table that they sit at with like the label or the (laughs) artist that they fuck with. And to have kind of like the exact opposite mentality is super refreshing. And like, let's talk about just drum and bass in the United States. And on the last podcast, we really went into 
you finding your sound, really like experimenting with everything from kind of like bassier, trappier influence stuff to future based stuff. Like you did some releases on Subsidia that like had your voice that were really future based driven. Like where did you feel like drum and bass was that pivot for you? And how has it been to see the sound really explode in the United States and you like be part of this like movement? Well, when I started making drum and bass, I was just like, okay, well, this is like becoming a new popular thing. Maybe I should give it a shot. But then I realized, oh, wait, this is literally a punk song just with <laughs> electronic elements. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, wait, like, I, I, yeah, like I had a session with my buddies in Philly um, and we were just messing around making like finding like YouTube punk beats. <laughs> Like, so good making like like ridiculous emo songs and like i was trying to find a top line for um a song i wanted to make with a friend but it just didn't work out um but the top line that me and my buddy wrote together i turned it into a drum and bass song because i was just like this has like that feel that punk feel of that like but it has like the energy of a drum and bass song. I feel like dr- if we're going to make drum and bass popular in America, we need to l- kind of Americanize it mm-hmm. in a way that like our culture can relate to it. Like the European, like UK drum and bass is so awesome. So good. And it's so good. You so know, there's good. nothing <laughs> like it. Mm-hmm. But it's like we'd be almost stealing a culture if we tried to take that over in the u.s you know what i mean and it's just like there's a lot of stuff in like uk drum and bass that we can't really relate to in the united states like they they talk a lot about their culture and their songs Mm -hmm. and and it's just like if i'm american and i'm making this style of music i'd like to talk about my own culture and and what i experience on a day-to-day you know what i mean i love that I feel like I've never heard that take. (laughs) But that's why I feel like your music really sticks out amongst the many trying to kind of really push themselves into the drum and bass space right now. Because I've heard so many conversations about uh, like stateside artists kind of being really frustrated because they can't necessarily get their songs signed to European labels. And then you kind of have vice versa where it takes a whole handful of European drum and bass artists to come here and fill the room and smash it out. And and now you're seeing stateside D&B artists starting to band together to create their own culture and their own adaptation and their own kind of like, I would say – maturity of the sound itself and I think that's really exciting and that's where like you fit in because I just feel like your sound design is like angsty like it's like got this high energy stuff but it's not this crazy like re-space neuro funk work you know like prodigy meets like a manu kind of deal it has this like really raw feel to it but then that's where you're like vocals sit as well in the creative process do you normally start with like vocals or like doing a flip and then add it like adapting it to being an original or how does that usually work for you is it different every time so I generally like to start with a song idea like and like a kind of like an intro build Mm -hmm. um and then I make the drops off of like melodic elements um off of what I've put in the verse okay you know Mm -hmm. um and since I come from, like, a live recording background after working in, like, recording studios where I was, like, setting up mics to record guitars, you know, and, like, setting up mics to record a piano, like, you know, taking the back part, off, like, wood part off of the piano so we could stick mics in there. So it's just, like, I know what a raw sound is supposed to sound like. Mm-hmm. And I've figured out ways – to recreate a synth so that it could sound a bit more raw and like Love mixing that. it as if I'm mixing a guitar. Okay. Sick. Sick. So do you use like a lot of like – you're in Ableton, right? Yeah. Do you use like a lot of like their kind of like amp plugins where you're kind of running everything through 
a dry signal or do you like saturate or distort the fuck out of it? Or is it like a lot of resampling? And then we're getting a little technical. I'm, oh, I've always been like the less is more type yep. person. Cause it is, mm -hmm. it really is. And it's like, if you don't have the initial sound right, it's, you're never going to get it to where you want it to be. Yep. And I actually strongly dislike Ableton's amps. I don't really, think they're very good. Okay. <laughs> they're, yeah. Are, are there some that are your like favorite that you use from like third party places or you just kind of really take that raw sound and make it as good as possible and then you do kind of like minimal compression saturation call it a day I do very minimal I use like the Ableton saturator okay and I switch it to analog mm -hmm. and I actually don't even touch any of the session settings so I just switch the waveform yeah and it makes such a huge difference and then I just like EQ out all the lows um, if there's a frequency that frequency that I can hear that's like annoying me, I'll EQ it out. Yeah. Um, and then I'll use the generic compressor. Mm. Um, and sometimes just completely flatten out all the dynamics. <laughs> Squish it. Yeah. And then um, I like to use the STL tones. Okay. Like hub for my guitars sounds. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of good ones in there. Oh, and it's like fun. a really cheap subscription. I love that. I um, love the subscriptions. When we add up all of our subscriptions, we're actually paying a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> we love yeah. that. Love that for us. The only subscriptions I pay for are like kilohertz because sometimes I'll experiment with some of their um, plugins. Their resonators are great. Yeah. I really enjoy their resonators. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have a couple of their plugins in some of my chains that I've made. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to keep paying for them. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Um, and then I pay for like auto tune, mm -hmm. which surprisingly, I don't use a lot of auto tune. I actually use it for their tools. Like they have the auto key. Yep. And then um, I'll use like their chorus generator sometimes for background vocals. Because um, it's Archura, right? Or R R RTS. Oh, what's the company? The company starts with an A. Yeah, it starts Remember? with an A, oh, and I'm but I'm butchering <laughs> it. I'm butchering it. I had a problem with my license the other day, and I like emailed support for the third time. I'm like, you guys, it says it's activated, and it's not activated, and you need to help me, and you need to help me get it fixed because I love using it for the tools. It has a great reverb. It has a great auto key. Like if you have like the ultimate kind of subscription thing, there's a lot of shit that you use in it, and that's what a lot of like very high level people use that auto tune. Yeah, it's just easy. Yeah, if I use auto tune, I use it very lightly. Because mm -hmm. um, what I usually do for my vocals, I do the same thing over and over again so that my vocals always sound the same. Okay. Um, I have like a vocal chain I use every single time. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have like a um, group of tracks from when I recorded Youth. Oh. And I take that group of like tracks. And I just plop it into the next session. And I just re-record the vocal. That's easy. That's yeah. perfect. And so they're already mixed and ready to go. It just keeps your like <laughs> consistency of this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm panning here. This is what I'm layering, doubling. And then your chains are all set up. And then there's like minimal cleanup. It just depends on like what frequencies you're hitting. At that point, it's just levels. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy. Mm-hmm. I kind of like that idea, <laughs> but it's to definitely to create a consistent sound where I feel like some people definitely have their vocals sounding mad different every time. Yeah. And, and that can, I feel like it complements your sound where you really do have like your own sound where if somebody's kind of switching soundscapes or switching genres, BPMs, all of that stuff, it could cater to a different kind of soundscape palette. Um, with you doing a lot of kind of flips and remixes, but also creating original records. How do you balance that and approach it? Because I think we're dealing with like a crazy time right now where a lot of people are quite frankly seeing like huge, huge levels of success off of doing kind of like the old reboots of the nostalgic tunes, you know, whether it's Flume or it's kind of going off like the million dollar baby, like the hit song of the week. And then there's not like a lot of attention on the original records, but you're doing both. So where does that balance kind of lie with you? I try not to do any remixes of songs that are not on brand for me. Okay. You know, if I'm going to be if, like, this is my sound. I'm going to remix songs or artists 
that are very close to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, or just I just genuinely like the song, like the Alley Cat song. I just really like that song. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it's a great fucking song. And she's just so talented, too. I just like. I met her at like a brownies and lemonade event and she came up to me and was just like, I love your music. And I'm like, (laughs) oh, love that. (laughs) She's a sweetheart. But um, I generally try to stick to like 2000 pop punk songs and like remixing them and putting in my sets or if there's like something popping off right now that I really like. Like I'll never remix a song I don't like. Yeah. Um, Just for like the the trend. Yeah. Yeah. People catch on to that so quickly. Mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and it's just like and then to balance it like with my own music it's like I try not to make my remixes sound too far from like my own songs yeah like I'll reuse sounds from my remixes into my own songs okay which I love because I mean at the end of the day it's how can I conceptually fit into your set and flow from like one song to another and be cohesive and everybody go oh that's Maggie that's ghost in real life Mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's interesting because you definitely see some people be like fuck the remixes fuck the bootlegs and they don't even touch them or you see people go full in which is what a lot of people are doing right now because I think I saw Odd Prophet which is like he's like a dubstep producer like super heavy never say die guy and he tweeted like a few months ago and he was just like the best way as an up and coming producer to get heard is to do the remixes and do the bootlegs. And it's like, I agree with that, but it's also like, it can only take you so far because the original records are what like help build your community and help really like stick out. It's like all of your favorite producers, you don't necessarily, or at least I don't necessarily have loved them or discovered them because of the remixes. It's been because of their own original music right. that has eventually caught on or or an album or an EP or just like a crazy record. Right. Well, it's like all of like, a, it's a marketing scheme. It's like, how am I going to attract the audience and then get them to my songs, right? Most people who are music lovers will find a remix that you're doing and be like, do they even make their own music? Like they'll get like that kind of like attitude Mm -hmm. and then they'll go and look up your Spotify and then they'll be like, you know what? This is actually not that bad. I actually really like them. Then you get a fan. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. It's like a happy medium balance. It really is. It really is. I feel like the SoundCloud era is like low key back. It's not what it was. I don't think it ever will be what it was when we like were first getting into electronic dance music and you saw people like, Lewis the Child and, you know, Son Holo and Maddie on make remixes that just hit millions and millions and millions of plays. Like we don't, it's just not in that phase anymore. But I think that it's kind of just the balancing of like the short form content. And you've done a lot of singles. Is there like an EP or like a larger conceptual record that you plan on working on in the future? If not, you're working on now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I always have like an EP in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a matter of finding a home for it. Yep. You know, no, we love that. <laughs> EPs are expensive. Yes, <laughs> they are. <laughs> so, but it's like I'm always creating music that could all potentially work in an EP. Cool. I love that. I love that. So where did the, I think I didn't ask you the last time you were on this podcast and I regretted it. And where did Ghost in Real Life come from? So... Um, I had like a previous electronic music name, Miss Beltran, and I hated it. Okay. It was just not it. It was not it. <laughs> I was like, I want to make electronic music because like I've always wanted to make, I've always wanted to be like a pop music producer, mm-hmm. you know? Um, there's always been a performance side of me, but I've always been like wanting to learn about engineering and producing and writing and um and throughout college, I always I I taught myself to do like pop music. And then when I was working in studios, I'd have so much free time that I'd sit on my laptop and make electronic songs. Okay. So then um, I started like a little project so that I'd have a home for my songs I was making. But I was just like, I hate this name. <laughs> so when I got like horribly screwed over in a studio I was working at, um, a group of guys didn't like the fact that I was the n- one, the next to move up. Yeah. And so they tricked me into getting fired. They Love left. That. 
<laughs> they left a storage unit unlocked and they wrote my name down on the sign on the sign out sheet. And I had like no knowledge of it. And I kept trying to tell the studio manager, I was like, that wasn't me. I, I you know, they're like, your name's here, your name's here. So I got fired because of a group of guys not wanting a woman to get ahead. So um I was like, okay, I really want to make a project that's like feminist thinking, forward thinking, like like I'm a girl, deal with it. Mm-hmm. And but I didn't want to be so in f- everyone's face because that's just annoying. Mm-hmm. And then um so I started I googled acronyms for girl. It was like the first option. And I was like, oh, ghosts. Like I have like a lot of stuff with ghosts. This will work. <laughs> So what do you have with ghosts? Explain. Oh yeah. Explain. Let's go. Let's go into it. I need that. I need the ghost stories, honestly. Oh man, I've told these stories so many times. I was almost possessed once. Yeah, like I so I went to the five week like Berkeley College of Music camp. Yep. And we weren't allowed out of the dorms past 10 p.m. So us being teenagers that usually stayed up late mm-hmm. needed something to do. And this one kid like was like oh i got a ouija board and so we're like oh sick so we'd always spend like nights with the ouija board and crazy things would happen and then one night we planned to have this whole like we're gonna summon a demon night like everyone on the floor like we all like squeezed into this one room and um i didn't realize how sensitive i was to that stuff and they were like, they got this like really powerful energy. You could feel the room just get so heavy, like as soon as they started the session. And Whoa. then they asked it to take human form. And I felt hands on my shoulders and my head started like spinning. And then the room was spinning and I lost feeling of like in control of my whole body. And it almost felt like I, I wasn't even breathing. And I was like, I have to get a noise because I'm sitting behind like a lot of people. Like I'm in the back row and I'm like, I got to get people's attention. So I squeezed out like a little mm, <laughs> like, a noise and everyone turned around and then it kind of went all blurry and I hear people scrambling and someone yelling, stop the session, stop it, stop it. And the next moment I was laying on the floor and my whole body was like tingling and like my Shit. I was like frozen in a position that I was sitting in. Like like they had to carry me out of the room. <laughs> Yo. What? <laughs> yeah. And then ever since then I I like throughout like the whole like rest of the weeks of camp, I would have dreams of like something gra- like dragging my body down the hall into the room where the Ouija board was, almost through a mirror. And then I'd hear like a and I wake up and I go. <gasps> Holy shit, Maggie. What? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. (laughs) I've definitely, I have never personally experienced anything, but I've heard so many stories from people that I really trust of them like really experiencing shit that I am, I am like full believer of like spirits and stuff like that. And it's just, that's wild. That's wild. So this name is very fitting for you summary and fact and point because it really is it's like I like I have you in my phone as saved as like girl because that's kind of what it is but that's like your messaging but then it's like ghost in real life and I like it too because it's got this kind of like indiscreet it's got like a feminist vibe to it but it's not in your face like what you said because yeah people are like get out of here with that which is kind of annoying because I'm all for it, but it's also like you're towing this line and it also fits the sound. I I do feel like it fits the sound. Yeah. Like the thing is too, it's like I I didn't choose the name off of like my really cool ghost stories. (laughs) I chose it because being a ghost, it's like you're often like you're invisible, but you're harmless. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's like I've always felt like being a woman in, in like a man's like world or like area of expertise where it's mostly men. It's just like nobody really sees me for like me. No one really sees like no one like expects me to have like a wide range of, of 
gear Mm-mm. of knowledge of gear and like no one expects to me to like like there's so many times where people just assume I don't know anything about mix and mastering okay. you know when I was like trained by a guy who works for isotope you know it's like Oh. You could just ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely – some people definitely don't understand until they're put in a position like this. And there's a lot of industries where it is male-dominated. You know, a lot of STEM work, a lot of the entertainment industry. And a lot of people don't know your background as being an like a true audio engineer. Like that's where like you come from. And right. then, you know, because of a series of events, you were kind of given this clear path to go down this endeavor and give it like 120%. Right. And to see like it's never a diagonal increasing line of like your progression in your project. It's never going to be like that for anybody. But to see kind of like your experimentation and your different soundscapes that you've taken and now like the body of like work that you formed underneath like the ghost in real life project, it has to feel good. And it has to feel good too. And like somebody from your past hits you up and is like, oh, da 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 and you're like, yeah. And it's just like, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. But that's being a woman in this industry. And there's a lot of like, I feel like we are fortunate enough to where there are a lot of men who like are advocates for women, right? but it's still an uphill battle. We still do start with questions and, you know, lack of confidence in our knowledge. And you have to be so overly knowledgeable. And so I'm going to work my ass off and prove myself to get to that even playing field where you're even with a counterpart. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's like I try to be like as forgiving as possible. I feel like there's like a lot of changes and stuff that like a lot of dudes still need to learn. And I like to give everyone a chance to realize the mistakes that they've made. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah, it's like awesome to like have someone from my past being like, wow, when I remember when we were in the studios and you were just doing this and I'm like, yeah, it's good to hear from you. You know? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I never like try to be spiteful towards people in my past because it would have never made me who I am. I love that. I love that. So moving forward, are there some things that you can let us know that you're excited about that you could maybe share with us? Because I feel like you have a lot of stuff going on. You just announced some shows with Subtronics, yeah. which is very exciting. And I've seen you like doing some pop-ups here and there. Like give us a little bit of a lowdown of like what we can be on the lookout for moving forward. Um, well, I know everyone wants like an EP for me. So I have like a mini EP coming up. Ooh, it's like a little fun idea on a label. I don't know if I can announce that yet. Okay. Um, but it's coming. It's coming very okay. soon. Like this summer. Let's do it. And then, I mean, other than that, I'm just excited for like the upcoming opportunities. Like, honestly, I didn't think I'd have any shows <laughs> like this. Oh, look at you. <laughs> look at you. I'm just like, I don't know. I kind of like to just, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> be filled with gratitude always. Cause then it never like, if you don't expect anything and you're in it for like the love of it. Then everything is like, wow, this is sick that this is happening. And there's like not an expectation set. And that's, hundred percent the way to go about it. Are you uh testing out any new music in your deadbeat set today? Always. Always. I'm always testing out new music. I try to make a song at least once a month. Yes. You know, just I love that. I, I'm like way more busier than I usually was. Usually I was making like three or four songs a month. Um, like between remixes and like original songs, but I'm trying to like at least okay, we're gonna do at least one or two a month. <laughs> timeline you create your own timeline which yeah. is a daunting thing in this because yeah. you can become gosh I I don't let like somebody said to me like once don't let perfection get in the way of excellence and I think that like that paired with me reading the Rick Rubin book right now I feel like my whole body is filled with with levels of enlightenment as to everything is just a chapter or a preface to the next body of work and the next body of art. And like no one record is going to define exactly who you are. You just have to keep building. Yeah. I used to get like really frustrated with like songs I've released in the past being like, oh, I 
did I release that when I could have been releasing this? And mm -hmm. But it like, it's all part of like the growing as an artist it is, you know, it is <laughs> very much so it is. Well, Maggie goes from real life. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're going to go smash your set at Civic Center Park for the Dead Beach Jamboree. And I'm so glad we got to do this in person. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This of was course. Great. Yep. Bye guys. See ya. Thank you.